was in my prayer time and these are the words that God said to me. The greatest proof that you are saved is that you begin to look like your Savior. The title of today's message is Godly Character. Okay, Godly Character. It is necessary for all of us here today to develop a godly character. Why? Because it is needed. It is a must for this generation. And I'm going to talk about that in a moment. But let's, let's turn to Numbers 20 verse 8. This is going to be a little bit of a, a, a long verse, a long scripture, but, but I, it's going to be worth it. It's a lot, there's a lot of meat in here. So Numbers 20 verse 8. And I hope that you can follow along if you have your Bibles with you. Uh, uh, read along with me. So it says, take the rod and you and your brother Aaron assemble the congregation and speak to the rock before their eyes that it may yield its water. You shall thus bring forth water for them out of the rock and let the congregation and their beasts drink. So Moses took the rod from before the Lord just as he had commanded him. And watch this. I, I, I need you to look at this. And Moses and Aaron gathered the assembly before the rock. And he said to them, listen now, you rebels. Shall we bring forth water for you out of this rock? Then Moses lifted up his hand and struck the rock twice with his rod. And water came forth abundantly. And the congregation and their beasts drank. But the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, because you have not believed me to treat me as holy in the sight of the sons of Israel. Therefore, you shall not bring this assembly into the land which I have given them. All right. So I want to talk about today about the importance of godly character. Let me summarize what we just read. Let me give you a little bit of context about what we just read. So uh, this was the time, the season where the group, the, the people of Israel were wandering in the desert. Why? Because they were not willing to fight for the promised land. Number one is this, the character that God looks for is that we need to be willing to fight for what we want. We must fight in the faith for what we want. And I'm not saying this, that it requires our effort but it is our fight of aggression in the spiritual realm of not willing to give up of not willing to let go in order for us to achieve what God has promised to us and so I want to tell you that the people of Israel they were not willing to fight let me tell you that also in the New Testament it says that it is who who takes the kingdom by force it is the violent it doesn't say the passive doesn't say the, the people who are just, you know, not doing anything in the kingdom of God. It is those who are violent that take the kingdom by force. So one of the characters that God asks of us is that we become violent in the spirit. Not violent naturally, not abusive, but violent in the spirit. So they were unwilling to do that. They were unwilling to go to the promised land. And they preferred to remain in comfort. And here's the danger. So... The thing is that when you're in your comfort zone, you'll realize that what tends to happen is a lot of criticism, gossip, judgment. Idle hands is the environment that gets us to begin to murmur. And we tend to murmur about the people that are playing the game, right? Like how many of us, like when we're watching a sports game or you're watching boxing or you're watching your favorite soccer team and you're like, man, why did Messi do that? As if you're better than him. But see, when you're watching the game, when you're a spectator, you have that audacity to be able to say, man, I want to murmur against what this guy is doing. But let me tell you this. So Moses, the Bible says that he was one of the most meek people on earth. Now watch this. So he was one of the most meek people on earth. That means that he was patient. He had a good attitude. He was someone who, who uh, you can tease him and he wouldn't reply back in aggression. You could uh, yell at him and he wouldn't reply back in aggression or violence. But watch this. But everyone has their breaking point. And Moses being the most meek person ever, 
it got to the point where they were just bashing Moses. They were criticizing every move he did. They were questioning him. They were questioning his family. They were questioning every aspect of his ministry. And Moses was just fed up with it. And not only that, but the Bible says that all of them began to say, Moses, why would you take us out of Egypt? We would have rather remained in bondage because there was water there. There was at least food there. They were struggling. And so watch this. So in that instance, Moses hearing all of this, he goes to God and says, God, honestly, I'm fed up with these people. I'm upset with everyone. And God's like, okay, chill. Let me do a miracle. Let me allow water to come out, okay? Let me allow water to come out of this rock. Maybe people are just thirsty. That's why they're all pissed off and angry and upset. Maybe they're just thirsty. So let's, let me bring water out of a rock in this desert and everyone will feel better. And so he says, Moses, gather the whole assembly. Gather everybody and speak to this rock and say, rock, give out water and, ro and water will come out. But guess what Moses does? Moses does not listen to God. He does somewhat of what God asked him. So he gathered everybody together. And he said, all right, Israel, come on. Everyone come together around this rock. And then he comes up to them and says, look, it's, it actually says it in the Bible. He says, you rebels, come here, everyone, you rebels, gather around here. And not only that, but then he starts being sarcastic. He says, yeah, all of you guys are thirsty. Do you want water to come out of this rock? Not only that, but then he grabs his rod. And then as hard as he can, he hits the rock and goes. Phew, phew, and then water comes out. Watch this. God still responded with miracles. Only because God responds with a miracle through your life doesn't mean he approves of your character. And so he then goes to in the private and he says to Moses, Moses, you didn't do what I asked you. Instead, you did the opposite. You were upset with everyone. You hit the rock and you yelled at everyone. I don't approve of that. And in fact, you cannot make it to the promised land anymore. And here's the thing, that the, the water still came out because the miracle signs and wonders aren't a response so much so of us, but it is so much so of the need of people. So if, if God sees people that are in need, he responds with miracle signs and wonders according to the need. And this is the issue, why I was saying that this is lacking in the people of God, the church of God, is that we have so many anointed people without their characters being checked. Should I just drop mic right there? We have too many people who are anointed with the fire of God in their lives. And we assume that God approves their character because there's miracles happening. See, God does the miracles because there's people in need that show up. And God responds for, for the needs of people. But we then need to better our character in God. And this is what I'm trying to say today is this, that God wants his people to have a godly character. See, the miracles, signs, and wonders, the anointing attracts people to your life, but it is your character that maintains people around you. Ooh. If you want people to follow you, to respond to your leadership, to respond to your life, to respond to your ministry, it is your character that matters. Character matters. I want you to say that with me. Character matters. Your family wants your character to, to improve. Can I tell you this? What is character then? Character is not how you act and behave at church. Character is how you treat your spouse. Character isn't how you act around the pastor. Character has to do with how you act with others in your workplace, how you treat those who are close to you, how you treat your neighbor. That's your character. Okay? So what we need to do is develop a godly character in us. Let me show you in 1 Timothy 3.2. So once again, 1st book of Timothy uh, chapter 3 verse 2. And look at what it says. 
This is the Apostle Paul giving, um, he's giving instruction to his disciple called Timothy. And Timothy is just starting out in ministry. He's starting out as a leader. And so this is what the Apostle Paul tells him. He says, an overseer then must be above reproach. The husband of one wife, temperate. What does temperate mean? Temperate means that I can control my temper. Okay? That is a quality that the Apostle Paul said, hey, what I want for there to be a mark in a leader is that they must control their temper. They must be, uh, so they must be temperate, they must be prudent. What does prudent mean? Is that I need to in advance have wisdom to the situation I'm going to get into. Let me put it this way. How many of us know that we need to treat certain people a different way that we wouldn't treat other people? I give advice to people in a different way because I know their level of, uh, of, of either maturity or their character. There's some people I can't confront because I know how they will respond. So I got to get at them in a different angle. But that is what prudency is. is I need to assess. If, if you know that person is a lion, why would you go and pull on their whiskers? You're asking for trouble. Be prudent. No, I know who they are, so yo, I'm going to go up to them in a different way. Okay, what else? Respectable. They must be respectable people. Not only that, that we ask for respect, but also that we respect other people. What else? This is one, I, I believe this is one of the greatest tests of character. It is how you do at being hospitable. How are you in that? When people are over to your house, how are you? That shows a lot. <laughs> that shows a lot about your character. All right? Now, they must be able to teach, not addicted to wine, or be pugnacious. What does pugnacious mean? Pugnacious is that word that means that, that, that we get upset very quickly. You do something, I immediately lash out. You know? You, you say something about me, and I'm like, what? That is pugnacious. God says, my people should not be pugnacious. Don't be like a brother or sister walking around like you have like a, a gun in your pocket. I'm just waiting for someone to say something to me. No, don't be pugnacious. All right? Here's the next one. Be gentle. Be peaceable. Free from the love of money. Okay? These are all the qualities that the Apostle Paul is saying. This is what I want of my leaders. This is what I want of my people. I want them to carry a character that people are able to receive from. Can I say this to you? Why does God ask this of us? Because people will remember more about how you treated them than what you have said to them. As a pastor, I know that 100%. Because I, I, don't, even know, like, I don't even know if you remember what I preached about on, in January, in February. Do you remember what I preached about last year? I mean, I don't even remember, so I don't blame you. <laughs> but what I'm trying to say is this, is that we don't remember exactly what people say, but we remember how they treat us. And that is the effect. People aren't going to walk out of the church saying, oh, man, I, I, I remember that this is what they say. No, I remember how they made me feel. So this is the important aspect that we need to understand that people care more about how you treat them than what you have to say to them. Okay. Um, I, I want to say this, that um, I was reading a, a couple of uh, articles, statistics on, I, I, I always like to learn about the next generation because I believe that this is the generation we're trying to lift up to become leaders. One thing that I was reading about, and I'm not saying this in a way to throw shade or, or to demean or, or, or anything, it's just that we need to understand the, the generation we're dealing with. And so I, I was reading that Generation Z is one of the generations that is most sensitive to people's characters. I'm about to say something that might sound weird, but Generation Z is one that cares more about character than the anointing you carry. And this is a generation that we are going to confront. This is a generation that many leaders will wonder, why aren't the next generation coming to church anymore? Why aren't people coming to church anymore? Why aren't people coming to the concerts of worship anymore? Why aren't people coming to miracle crusades? You know why? Because it's a generation that cares about character. They care. They see their parents. They see their example. Do I really want to follow Christ if that's how I will become? 
I don't want that. And so us as parents, we need to be people who are understanding that the next generation is looking at us. So let's develop a godly character so that they too can develop that character in their life. Is anybody receiving this today? You need this for your life for the next generation. Man, so what is character? So let me tell you that the Bible, um, it, the, the Greek word for character is actually the same one. Character, character. And so this Greek word has a specific meaning. This is why I put that, uh, that statue there. Um, is because the word character is the same word that was used for the word chisel in Greek. Chisel. It is the tool of the sculptor. So in other words, when God is saying that I want you to develop character is that he's holding a chisel. And he is hammering into your life. Because that's what sculptors do. They have this hammer and chisel. And, and, and they go to a p big piece of rock and they form it however they want until they get the image that is in their mind. Can I tell you something? That the image that God has in his mind is not a better version of you. The, 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 the image that God has in his mind is of Jesus. And he doesn't want a better version of you. Actually, he wants you to die so that the Christ in you can resurrect. It's so that the character that people see in us is the character of Jesus. When we're talking to people that they perceive Jesus in us. Character matters. You know how much so character matters is because we tend to assess or remember people in terms of their character. If right now I just began to name names, the first thing you will think of is their character. If I name to you, hey, you know, Bob, the first thing that comes to mind will be like, oh, Bob, yeah, oh, yeah, gossiper. Oh, this person, oh, he's, um, yeah, he's stubborn. What about this person at church? Oh, yeah, they're this, they're that, they're that. We tend to judge people, you know, in accordance to their character. Can I ask you something? What would people say about you if you weren't in the room? What would they say? Oh, man. John, you know, if I weren't in the room, what would people say about me? <laughs> and so it's, it, it matters. So what we need to worry about is our character. It's so important. This is how people perceive you and remember you. Okay? So, okay, you need character for people to follow you and trust you. You know, this is one of the reasons why I don't think I could ever or ever want to be a politician. All right? <laughs> I mean, when it comes to politics, literally, it's in, in the name or in the meaning of the name. It's about the populace. It's about being popular. And can I tell you that to be a politician, especially nowadays, you've got to give up values in order to get, gain more followers. It's about being popular. But in God's terms of, of character, character does not lead necessarily to popularity. Can I tell I want to say that again. See, the character that God wants of us, biblically speaking, Jesus, his character is not necessarily popularity. Let me put it this way because, I, or let me, let me ask it in this way. How many, val, how many followers would it take for you to give up some of your values? Just think about that for a moment. How, how, how many more, is, are your values for sale? Oh, man, but pastor, if, if I gained a million followers and I just keep silent about this topic, let me ask you something. Are your values for sale? So what God is saying is that this is what character is. Jesus says it in this way. He says, are you willing to gain the whole world but forfeit your soul? Jesus says that. That's his words. He was training his disciples to not go and attract the masses. See, your calling is not to be loved by everyone, but to love everyone. Because if you had it all twisted around and said, my calling is to be loved by everyone, let me tell you this, that to be loved by everyone means for you to have no character in your life. But someone who has character, who knows their values, who knows who they are, who knows where they're going, that's the type of people that God wants in his kingdom. And that's what's necessary for today. People of character. People who know who they are. And where is that form? That's formed at home. Man, nowadays the ones defining what it means to have a manly character, who is it? The world. Can I tell you, they can't even answer that question. What is a man or what is a woman? 
So let's not depend on the world to define the, uh, the, the values of what it means to be a manly character or a womanly character. Go to what our designer. Go to our sculptor. He designed us. He made us. And he will tell you what is a godly character. I don't know about you, but I actually made this, and I, I've been interrupting in my school every here now and then because I care about who's forming my child, Xavier. And, and this is what is important is that, see, the definitions of what man or woman is must be formed at home. It is not the job of the populace or, or society or the world. And so what I want to say is this, is that if we ourselves don't know what it means to have a manly character according to God, how can we transmit that to our kids? If I don't know what Proverbs 31 says about women and how, we, how women should be, how would you transmit that to your daughter? And so what we need to turn to is to our God and say, God, form the character that you want of my life so I can transmit it into somebody else. Is anyone re receiving this, understanding this? Yeah? Because it's important. I care about the next generation and where it's headed and where it's going. We need a church that has character. Okay? We need a church that has character. Okay. Um, look at Proverbs 27 verse 19. So Proverbs 27, 19 says this. As in, in water, face reflects face, so the heart of man reflects man. Let me say that again. As in water, face reflects face, so the heart of man reflects man. This is important. Your character is how you express, uh, sorry, how your heart expresses itself. So let me say that again. Your character, how you act in front of others, is how your heart expresses itself. So it's not your behavior that needs to change. It's your heart that needs to change. You have issues with character and, 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 and everything that is going. It's not behavioral modification that you need. You need a heart transformation. That's what the Bible is, is telling us. Okay? So if that is true, so if my heart is bitter, then my character is going to be bitter. If your heart is hurting, your character will either hurt others or you will avoid relationships altogether. So it matters how you, the condition of your heart is, okay? But there's only one person that can change the matters of your heart, and he is called the Holy Spirit. He can change your heart. Now, let me, uh, let, let me say it in this way as well. Um, in, 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 in 1 John 4.19, it says that we love because he first loved us. Notice that pattern. We love because he first loved us. And what is love? Well, in 1 Corinthians 13, 4, that's where it then says, well, love is this. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not boast. Love is not proud. And also, uh, love uh, keeps no records of wrong. So what I want to tell you is this, is that love is God's character. It is his character. And so if you look at all those things that God, that, that love is patient, love is kind, love does not boast, love is not proud. When you look at all of those things, that, those are the characters that God expects of us. But he says, I can, you cannot reflect that unless you first receive it. When you eat of it, then you can reflect it. In other words, how can I ever develop a patient character if I've never received the patience of God? Same thing about forgiveness. How can I be forgiving to other people if I've not first received the forgiveness of God? And that changes you. I tell you that it's not so much about struggling to fight to gain your character. It's about re just receiving the truth of who God is, who that love is, and you will reflect that to other people. Uh, let, let me put it in this way or, or give you this example. That when there are times that I mess up or when there are times that I make a mistake, that actually, and, and, and when I receive the forgiveness of God and I receive that character of him, the next time someone comes up to me and says, hey, pastor, I've messed up. I've made a mistake. What do you think my response would be? I'm not going to go and tell them, yeah, you sinner, get out of here. You, you, you're, see, you're not even a Christian. You're not a believer. My response is different because I've seen how God forgave me. I'm willing to be so forgiving to other people. 
And the more you receive that truth that God forgives you, that God loves you, that God is patient towards you, that God is not proud against you, that he is, that keeps no records of wrong, I'm not going to respond in an evil way towards my neighbor. I'm going to respond in a positive way. Is that making sense? Okay. So, man, I fail, God is faithful. I make a mistake, God is patient and forgiving. And so in the same way, someone does a mistake, I must also respond in that same godly character and show patience. So I want to tell you, how do we change our character? The first step is this, recognizing that you have that character. Why is this important, recognizing? A lot of the time, we don't recognize. We use an excuse to cover it up, such as the excuses as, you know, I've, you know, I've used them myself as well, you know, but that's just how my culture is, right? Like, we're, we're just like that. You know, I'm Latino, so I have a little bit of Latino attitude. That's just who I am. <laughs> Yeah, tu sabe, you know. I, I, but, or, or, or there's other people that say, that's how my family is. I mean, my parents taught me to be like that. I'm going to be the same way with everybody else. But can I tell you something? The way to change is to recognize and not blame or use another excuse. It doesn't matter what your culture. Stop hiding behind your culture to excuse your bad character. Begin to address it and say, no, I'm going to change because that's what God is asking me to do. The next one is this, ask God for forgiveness and renounce the character. Let go of whatever the Holy Spirit reveals to you. You know, there's a lot of things that are hurting our hearts and that we need to let go of and, and, and say, God, f help me to forgive. Help me to let go so that I can change my character. And next one is this, ask the Holy Spirit to give you his fruit. And his fruit is what encompasses all of God, uh, Jesus' character. Uh, I want us to turn now to Romans 5, 3. Romans 5, 3. And, and it says this, okay. And not only this, but we also exult in our tribulations, or we're, we're excited in our tribulations, which sometimes it doesn't make sense, but, but we, 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 we rejoice in our tribulations, knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance. Next one. So it brings about perseverance. And perseverance leads to what? Proven character. And proven character then produces hope. And next verse, then it says this. And hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Now, I... You're not alone if you can't connect the dots here. Because the first time I read this, I couldn't connect the dots. I understood it so far to the point where it says that we develop a godly character. I understood it up to that point. Because what the Bible is saying is this. That our tribulations that we go through, the problems we go through, the stress, the, the anxieties, everything, every storm that we go through. It is there to be able to produce in us perseverance. Say that with me. Perseverance. It is meant to produce perseverance in you. And that is the quality where you can continue to keep going even against all resistance, against all problems, against all gossip, criticism, or betrayal, whatever you've gone through in your life. But perseverance means I'm not going anywhere. So the tribulations bring about a perseverant attitude. You said, what about me? It's all good. I've died to myself. I'm good with that. God bless you and I love you. You did what? That's fine. All of this is just tribulation to make me perseverant. Okay? So we must develop a perseverant attitude. And then perseverance then leads to proven character. That's the next one. Not just regular character, but character that has been proven. What does proven mean? Is that you've gone through the proof of fire and you made it through. You have a proven character. And God asked that of us, that as we are going through tribulations, that's the chisel going into our life. That is God hammering into our life until Christ-likeness comes out of that. How many guys feel like you're being chiseled right now in your spiritual life? Oh, man, I feel like I've been chiseled. God is chiseling me, humbling me, changing my mind, changing my heart on many things. But that's the purpose of tribulation. Okay? And, and watch this. So it produces proven character. Now, you might get lost at the next one because I got lost. 
tribulation, perseverance, proven character, hope. Do you guys understand that? The hope part? I couldn't connect the dots. Because it's usually tribulations. That's what we preach on the altar. Tribulations, perseverance, proven character, anointing. Tribulations, perseverance, proven character, success, leadership, glory, power. But Apostle Paul says, no, hope. I didn't understand that. I didn't get it when I read that. What do you mean? Why do we need hope? And then the Apostle Paul has to then explain to us, hope doesn't disappoint people. Hope is what you need actually. More than your character, man, you need hope. What is this hope? Well, this hope is the hope of salvation. What's greater than anointing is knowing that I'm going to heaven. What's greater than anything is knowing that I'm coming with Christ when he returns. That's hopeful. That is the true, genuine hope that we need. And watch this. So the Apostle Paul is saying that you need this hope. This hope of salvation. But the only way for you and I to experience true, genuine hope is that we've gone through the tribulation. If you've gone through the tribulation... And when you look at yourself and you begin to say, you know what, I look like Christ now. Man, I went through hell, I went through fire, but at the end of it, I look like Christ. He says, if you look like Christ at the end of it, have hope. Want to know why? Here's something that maybe will never be, I was, in my, I was in my prayer time. And these are the words that God said to me. The greatest proof that you are saved is that you begin to look like your savior. I can end the preaching right there. The greatest proof that you are saved is that you begin to look like your savior. The only way that I can know if I am saved. Look, let, let me put it this way, okay? I'm not trying to preach a, a works-based theology, a work-based gospel. That's not what I'm trying to do. It is this, that the Bible says that the only way that we have salvation is what? By faith, sorry, by grace through faith. So by grace through faith, Jesus died on the cross for me. And all I have to do is just believe in the finished work of Christ. That produces salvation. And not only that, but I must trust and have faith in his finished work. Now here leads to the next question. How do I know if I've placed my faith in Christ? Isn't that interesting? Okay. Have faith in Christ to receive salvation. But how do I know if I've placed my faith in Christ? That's where the Apostle Paul says, you will know if you've placed your faith in Christ, not because you've been at church for a long time. You will know you've placed your faith in Christ when the tribulations have authenticated that faith. Can I ask you a question? Have the tribulations authenticated your faith? Have they chiseled you in a way that you can now look in the mirror and say, you know what? And I'm not saying you're going to be perfect now, that you're going to be sinless, that you're going to be, you know, uh, just, just having this amazing godly character right away. No, but at the very least, there's some change in you. And if there hasn't been absolutely no change in you, that is where Apostle Paul says, I don't know if I can give you hope. But this true hope comes and is generated when you say, you know what? God helped me through this situation. He made me a better person. He's changed my character. He's changed my attitude. That is the living proof I need that I am saved. If you need assurance, begin to work at looking like your Savior. My message today is this, that this generation is a generation that really cares about character. Your, your, your children, will, when they look at you, they're going to care about your character. Um... I want to tell you this, that, you know, when, when you're watching a show, if, if you haven't heard anything that I've said today, uh, just, just listen to this. Um, you know, when you're watching your favorite show, I don't know what that is, you know, but may, maybe you're watching Friends or maybe you're watching, um, I don't know, The Office. But you know that every time that this character is going to come up, you know they're going to be their character, Right? You know the funny guy. You know the person who, uh, you know, acts silly. You know the person who is smart. And there's always characters. But what tends to happen when someone is outside of character? It's like, man, that's actually so out of character. 
It doesn't, it doesn't match. And so let me tell you that in the same way, people have been reading the Bible, reading the word of God. And when they look at the church, they say, whoa, they're out of character. They're supposed to look like this man called Jesus, but they don't look like him. They don't sound like him. They don't talk like him. They don't have his, uh, his mind. And let me tell you, that is the way that we're going to win this next generation, by showing them this is what it means to seek Christ. Yes, I will go through the chiseling. Yes, you will go through the fire. You'll go through the proofing. You'll go through tribulations. But at the end of it, have hope. Have hope because that shows it all that you are saved. Oh, man. I don't know if there's anybody here today maybe saying, man, I want to I wanna be able to see my faith be authenticated. In this moment, I just want us all to just close our eyes. And actually, let's all stand up on our feet. Just for this moment, I... Like I said, I, I didn't understand that when the first time I read it. Because we've been told all our, all our lives that once you have good character, then you have amazing leadership. Once you have good character, then you have the success. It's the good character that produces anointing. None of those things are bad. It's good to have anointing. It's good to have leadership. It's good to have all of that. But most importantly is knowing where am I going when I die? Don't you think that's more important? I smile and I rejoice and I'm a happy Christian because I know I've been chiseled. I rejoice in my tribulations because I have hope. And the world wasn't when I was attacked. I was attacked by the enemy once I gave my life to Christ. That's when the tribulations came hardcore against my life. But I rejoice because I have hope. Today, are you in the room knowing that you can rejoice? Have you been treated through the fire? And if you haven't yet, maybe you're brand new in Christianity. This is more of something to encourage you and tell you, you will make it through the fire. You will make it through the storm. We are living testimonies. There are people in this church that are living testimonies that it is possible to persevere. It's possible to go through the challenges against our faith. But at the end of it all, there is hope. And a hope doesn't disappoint. It is James that says, faith without works is dead. That means that yes, have faith in Christ, but what authenticates that faith is that works are generated in your life. Works does not save you, but save salvation produces good works in you. It's not that the chiseling comes first. Salvation is free first of all. And how do I know if that prayer I've done on the altar when they said and made the altar call, how do I know if it was genuine? Well, we will see the works in your life. Is there a chisel in your life? Is your character changing? Or at least is there even something in you saying, I need to change? Because God cares about character because character leads you to the promised land. It's what kept Moses from going to the promised land. I don't want it to keep you from the promised land. You need character. You need character. And I feel the Holy Spirit doing His work right now. Ah. Holy Spirit, I pray that today's message is a message that I have entered into the hearts of people. Thank you so much for listening to one of our sermons here at Atmosphere Church. 
if you're ever in the area, we would love to have you come over and join us in one of our worship experiences. Also, just a friendly reminder to like, share, and subscribe to our Atmosphere Church YouTube channel. That way you never miss out on one of our live streams or one of our latest sermons. We love you so much and we can't wait to connect with you again.